So, uh, Ben, late Sunday night, the White House announced that an aircraft carrier strike group and a bomber task force were being deployed to the Middle East in response to indications that Iran was planning to attack U.S. forces in the region. Uh, Axios, I believe, later reported that the warning was based on intelligence passed along by the Israelis. So we don't know a lot of specifics here. We do know that Iran has a long history of giving Shia militia groups in Iran. Uh, We do know that we do know that Iran has a long history of giving Shiite militia groups in Iraq weapons that they later used to attack our troops. We also know that they have a history of harassing ships in the Strait of Hormuz. But, I mean, deploying one of our 11 total aircraft carriers is a pretty big deal, a pretty big response. What did you make of this decision? Well, I, I was pretty disturbed by it, Tommy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think there are a few things to say about this. One, Commander-in-Chief Bolton, um, you know, kind of made this blustery announcement. Yeah. And I think we need to be honest here, really a pretext for war. Like, the track record matters here. Yeah. And so I don't think we should just take at face value leaks to friendly, you know, journalists or, or even unfriendly journalists about how there's this intelligence. Uh, we, we haven't seen it. Um, and John Bolton has a history of cherry picking intelligence and, and frankly lying about intelligence. He did yeah. that before the war in Iraq. He did that on Cuba. Didn't he try the, to say the Cubans had a biological tr- weapons yeah, this program? Is one of the reasons he wasn't confirmed as UN ambassador is he he demanded that the State Department tell him that Cuba had a biological weapons program and they don't. Right. So I do think we just have to be very skeptical and we need to have our antenna up on Iran or Venezuela or anything else. John Bolton also went out a couple days ago and said that three Venezuelans were prepared to defect from Maduro and none of them did, right? So his intelligence um, has not exactly borne out. Um, (laughs) I think the second thing is, look, this idea that the Iranians might uh, be targeting U.S. uh, forces in the region, when the decision was made to designate the Iranian Revolutionary Guard as a terrorist organization, we were told uh, in reporting that the the Defense Department and the intelligence community opposed that action because they worried that it could put our troops in harm's way, that the Iranians might feel that they need to engage in some reprisal act. <coughs> so I don't know if that is related to the intelligence, but what we've seen consistently is a pattern of this administration seeking to provoke the Iranians into doing something, whether it's you know stepping out of the nuclear deal or some escalation in the region, that doesn't in any way, shape, or form give the Iranians the carte blanche to do that, and they should not do that. Um, but what I see is is this administration goading the Iranians into some action, and frankly, having an aircraft carrier and you know some bombers on call demonstrates what this administration wants to do in that scenario, which is essentially potentially engage in some military action with Iran. So I think we've talked for months on this podcast about the potential for escalation with Iran. I worry that we may be seeing that in real time now. Yeah. I mean, again, we've talked at length about the IRGC and the Quds Force and how they are bad actors. But there's also a long history, as we've also discussed in this country, of of wars needing a pretext from the Gulf of Tonkin uh, to remember the Maine to, you know, name your incident. Uh, it's, It's worrisome. Here's the other thing that really worries me. We pulled out of the Iran deal despite the fact that Iran is complying with the Iran deal. We are ratcheting up sanctions against Iran in ways that will cripple their economy, hurt the Iranian people. How do we climb down from this? Where is the diplomatic effort that will help reduce tensions? I mean, Bolton clearly has a regime change strategy. And if we provide the Iranians with two choices, capitulate completely or fight, I'm pretty sure I know which one they're going to choose. They're going to fight. And, you know, this is the problem. It's one year since we pulled out of the Iran deal. Throughout that year, Iran continued to comply, but the U.S. was the one who was isolated. We were isolated from our European allies. We were isolated, obviously, from Russia and China. We isolated ourselves, not the Iranians. And we did put these sanctions in place. They are having an effect. They're not having as big an effect as they would have. Uh, in fact, if you look at Iranian oil exports, they're not they're not falling, actually, in part because not a lot of other countries are going along with this, mm-hmm. and not a lot of the countries are refusing to purchase Iranian oil. Now there are reports that the Iranians might not comply with parts of the Iran deal, right? And that was almost inevitable. If you put, if we violate the deal, we essentially tear up the deal, and then the Iranians pull out and we say, you're going to have consequences, potentially military action, because you pulled out of this deal that we tore up. The rest of the world is not going to be with us in that effort. We, we, we're going to lack the legitimacy to do this. Um, and, and so, again, I don't see what the strategy is unless the strategy is to 
goad and goad and goad and press and press the Iranians until they do something, and then we have a pretext for military action. And that's a cynical view, but I'll, you know, I'll give you a couple other data points. Why is there no Secretary of Defense? Um, I, this must be the longest we've gone in history Truly. without a Secretary of Defense, Dominique. It's been four or five months. We know that Mattis was resisting efforts to go to war with Iran, and Mattis had argued to stay inside the Iran deal. It may be they don't want a strong Secretary of Defense to say, hey, this is a bad idea, guys. Uh, they're not good military options here. Uh, there was also a, a consulate that we had in Basra in southern Iraq, which is a Shia majority uh, part of Iraq. This consulate was open through some of the worst times of the Iraq war. We closed this consulate a few uh, months ago, saying that it was too dangerous to keep it open. Um, some of the people you know, I know who have been working in that part of Iraq thought immediately, well, are they closing this consulate because they're removing a potential target for the Iranians in the event of a military action? So th there are these warning signs that they're kind of setting the table um, to escalate with the Iranians. And I think we had to take this, you know, very seriously. I hope that nothing happens. Um, but, you know, we, you got Bolton out there making belligerent statements, talking about intelligence that we can't see. You've got aircraft carriers going to the region. You've got the Iranians now finally looking like they might do something potentially to not comply with parts of the Iran deal. This can spiral pretty quickly um, if there's a triggering event. Jesus, I didn't know. Sorry, I didn't that. mean to be. No, so, no, no. I mean, uh, look, yeah. I, I, I'd not heard that about the, the consulate in Basra. And, you know, the, the irony of it is that uh, the, one of the actions that they cited was an attack on the Iranian uh, consulate. So it wasn't even the Iranians who hmm. were involved in the threat information per se. But again, I, I'm not aiming to be a conspiracy theorist here. Because frankly, this is not a conspiracy theory. It's all in front of our eyes. You mm -hmm. got them issuing threats, them designating the IRGC, stacking up sanctions, you know, sending an aircraft carrier to the region, um, obviously closely aligned with Netanyahu mm -hmm. and MBS who want this conflict with the Iranians. And again, the only way I think we are assured in which there's not a conflict in the next year and a half is if the Iranians show a significant amount of restraint. And very little about their politics suggests that they can sustain that. They yeah. have hard, hard liners who are comfortable in some kind of adversarial, if not conflict, uh, situation with the United States. And, and we're playing into the worst elements in their system by provoking them like this. Uh, you mentioned Netanyahu. I mean, uh, so let's go to Gaza for a minute. After a very scary weekend of fighting, there's a ceasefire in place between Israel and Palestinian militants in the Gaza Strip. Uh, the AP reported that 25 Palestinians and four Israelis were killed. The Israeli Defense Forces said Hamas and other militant groups, uh, one called Islamic Jihad, launched nearly 700 rockets into southern Israel. Many were intercepted by Israeli defense systems like the Iron Dome, which is a system that U.S. tax, uh, which is a system that U.S. taxpayers paid for in part thanks to Obama, by the way. But um, you know, look, I, I'm I'm very glad for everyone involved that this this ceasefire is in place. Again, I worry that this fighting is very likely to happen again unless there is a, a diplomatic effort to resolve the broader tension in the in the situation in Gaza after 12 years of of you know it being blockaded and Hamas's is rule seemingly stronger than ever. Yeah, I mean I completely sympathize with any government saying that you can't have rockets fired yeah. indiscriminately at Absolutely us not. hitting civilian territory putting uh, innocent people at risk. Schools, hospitals, kids. I mean, it's yeah. utterly unacceptable. At the same time, you can't ignore the context of 12 years. I mean, I, I saw some people commenting, you know, well, and the Israelis don't even occupy Gaza in the way that they occupy the West Bank. But I, I don't, they don't occupy it physically with troops. But there's this blockade that prevents all kinds of materials from getting into Gaza mm -hmm. because the Israelis have very liberally defined a material that could be of benefit to Hamas. And so you have people essentially living in squalor, cut off from the rest of the world, restricted in their movements, and you can feel the boiling frustrations from within the population in Gaza. 60% like unemployment? Yeah, th these people have no jobs, no hope, no nothing. And they're hungry, and they feel humiliated by this blockade. And yes, they have terrible governance from Hamas, but you know what, like, I'm a little bit over the just blame the Palestinians for everything that happens 
when the reality is, as you said, this policy is not succeeding in dislodging Hamas. <laughs> you know, a, a policy of closing off and hermetically mm-hmm. sealing Gaza is, is not addressing the governance challenges uh, in the Palestinian uh, territories in Gaza. Um, it, it's entrenching Hamas and, and, you know, making them stake their claim on being the ones who stand up to the Israelis. And I think you, unless you want to be in this endless cycle um, where you have Palestinian civilians... Um, occasionally killed by Israeli security forces, and we should note, um, it's not always just when their rockets fired. I mean, um, the day that uh, our embassy moved to Jerusalem, dozens of Palestinians were killed mm-hmm. when they tried to approach the security barrier there. Um, there there have been uh, a significant amount of pal- Palestinian casualties throughout this. Um, there's going to be this endless cycle of building tensions in Gaza, rocket fires or protests, and then very aggressive Israeli reprisals, lives lost, mi- human misery in Gaza. And, and I think you have to get at the broader dynamic, which is how do we improve the lives of the people in Gaza? How do we make them feel connected to the outside world? How do we give them alternatives to Hamas? Um, mm-hmm. And I, I don't think the current approach of just keeping the boot on their throat is the, the way that's going to succeed. Yeah, I mean, this is these flare-ups could happen at any time. Yeah. And we also know, I mean, another relevant data point, to just be mindful of is that Jared Kushner has said that he's going to put forward the Trump administration peace plan sometime after Ramadan. So, you know, I guess June, July. And from all early reports and indications, it sounds like that plan won't have much to offer the Palestinian people in in terms of territory. They're going to try to buy them off with a bunch of economic yeah. sweeteners that I, I just, I, 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 it's hard for me to see a scenario where this is viewed as an acceptable plan and that there's not some sort of response. No. And you are <laughs> you are treating the Palestinian people like they're not been paying attention to what's happening. Uh, the United States has mm-hmm. closed down our diplomatic representation to the Palestinian people in Jerusalem. So we ba- basically said, we're treating you as stateless people. The Israeli prime minister has said he is going to annex the West Bank, or at mm-hmm. least major West Bank settlements. The president of the United States has recognized the Israeli annexation of the Golan Heights. So over here, you see the mm-hmm. U.S. president, the Israeli prime minister, clearly preparing to consolidate Israeli control over pieces of the West Bank and Israeli control over Jerusalem. And then over here, you got Jared Kushner talking about giving some minor <laughs> economic assistance to some parts of the West Bank. And by the way, for all we know, is that going to the Palestinian people or is that lying in the pockets of some people they're trying to pay off there? Mm-hmm. If you really wanted to address this issue, you need to include territory. How can you how can you solve the 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 dilemma of there being two peoples living in this area and not provide one of those peoples with a sense of where their state is going to be? Who would accept that deal? Nobody would accept that deal. Right. Well, and and so I think they're going to put this on the table, the Palestinians will reject it, and then they'll say, oh, well, the Palestinians can never say yes to a deal. Well, that's not a real fucking deal. Yeah. And by the way, if you want to help the Palestinian people, you need to address this blockade in Gaza, because we have hundreds of thousands of Palestinians living in complete and utter humiliation and destitution in Gaza. And, you know, this is not working. It's not like it's dislodging Hamas. Uh, let's improve their lives if, if we're really going to have a humanitarian effort aimed at helping the Palestinians. It's also hard to say that you're offering uh, aid or, or any sort of economic incentive when in February of 2019, the U.S. cut off all aid to Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza. So it's like yeah. you take something away, you try to give it back. Now, it might be much more substantial in terms of numbers or whatever. Who knows what Jared has been cooking up for like two and a half years but, uh, you know, it, it's, I don't think it's likely to Look, <laughs> go over a, well in a, the region. A deal is something where both sides give and both sides get. Yeah. The deal that they've been cooking up is the Israelis, dic- not just the Israelis, Bibi Netanyahu dictates the terms of Palestinian surrender, right? And, of course, the Palestinians say no to that, and then they blame them. And the, what we've seen time and again is that Trump has uh, certain groups of people that you know he sees as enemies, Cubans, Palestinians, Iranians, some Venezuelans, and and there, there is no such thing as a deal. It's just like you completely submit or or there's nothing. Then he's got his buddy like Kim Jong-un, who's done literally nothing, who is the most brutal dictator in the world, who's now firing off missiles, and he's praising him on Twitter, right? Mm -hmm. So this is not on the level. If you're, if you're in the groups of people that, you know, Trump has in his crosshairs, 
this is not diplomacy. Uh, diplomacy would be, how do you negotiate Maduro's exit? Diplomacy would be, what is the outline of a two-state solution? Diplomacy is not, you accept our terms, which are your complete and utter defeat and humiliation. Yeah, let's, uh, let's go to North Korea, because you mentioned it. So on Saturday, North Korea fired several short-range projectiles off its east coast. Uh, it is not in totally clear what kind of projectile, missile, whatever you want to call it, it was, though. Secretary Pompeo helpfully clarified on the Sunday shows that it wasn't an ICBM capable of hitting the U.S., so I guess it's all hunky-dory for him. You know, it's just the kind capable of killing, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Americans living abroad, along with all our closest allies in the region. So, you know, that should make everyone feel better. Um, what do you think Kim's doing here? And, and I, I guess if you were advising Trump, like, what do you think the next step should be? First of all, there's a rank smell of hypocrisy here, because... The Iranians sometimes fire off uh, ballistic missiles or space vehicles that cannot hit the United States. And Mike Pompeo rushes out like fucking General Patton, like this is the biggest crisis facing us in the world today, right? Yeah. And meanwhile, the North Koreans are firing off missiles that could take out tens of thousands of U.S. service members in South Korea and Japan, never mind take out major population centers in our treaty allies, South Korea and Japan. And he's like, well, no big deal, because he's out there spinning for this complete failure of a diplomatic process that they've had with North Korea. Clearly, what the North Koreans are doing is trying to get our attention, say, you didn't make the concessions we wanted. We didn't get our sanctions relief. We are going to be ratcheting up this, uh, this pressure. They've made no concessions, no rollback of the nuclear program, no inspections of the nuclear program, no rollback of the missile program, nothing. Uh, and, and now they're showing that they're willing to start testing these things again. They want concessions. If I'm the, the Trump administration, you know, what I'm trying to do is try to figure out what are incremental steps that we can take, right? You don't go to the big, big deal first where you say, we're going to lift all sanctions on North Korea in exchange for something the North Koreans are never going to do. You say, what are some incremental steps that we want? Do we want some inspections of uh, North Korean nuclear facilities? Do we want to see the North Koreans begin to dismantle pieces of their infrastructure, uh, their, of their nuclear program, in exchange for some limited sanctions relief? Make this a step-by-step -step process and not just this, like, periodic Super Bowl summit uh, thing where nothing happens. Yeah. Super Bowl summit. I like that. Yeah. Um, so let's update folks on the situation in Venezuela as well. A lot of huge issues out there in the news. I think we're jumping around. But um, so right before we recorded last week, it looked like there could be a major power shift towards the opposition in Venezuela. Juan Guaido, uh, the man the international community mostly recognizes as president, was calling for an uprising by the military. Another one of Venezuela's most prominent opposition leaders, a guy named Leopoldo Lopez, reemerged from house arrest. But then somehow it all fell apart. The Maduro loyalists who were supposed to switch sides from Maduro to the opposition never did. Uh, U.S. officials said that Maduro was about to leave the country, but then was stopped by the Russians and never left to go to Havana. It's hard to figure out what happened. But again, what's, what's particularly worrisome for me is that the chatter about U.S. military options seems to have increased. Uh, like, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to gut check how serious um, we think officials in Washington are about some sort of military intervention. Like, imagine you're yeah. Mike Pompeo or John Bolton. You go over to the Pentagon, you meet in the tank where the Joint Chiefs have their big military planning meetings. Like, aren't those guys in uniform telling you that this is an insane idea? Yeah, and I do think we have to just come back to this point of, like, it's a pretty astonishing thing how many things that this administration has said just didn't happen, right? <laughs> the, right. The, the, these guys the third been, time. The fact that this is the third time that they basically come out and announce that they're just about to win in Venezuela and none of these things materialized. I, it seems like if I'm going to be generous to them, and first of all, I'm going to do this. I haven't done it in a while. Mm -hmm. Imagine if we'd done that. <laughs> like, imagine if, like, Susan Rice went out and said that three Venezuelans are going to defect and we we're going to win today and nobody defected. And, uh, like, <laughs> Lindsey Graham like, would have lit himself Lindsay on Graham fire in front of the White and, House. And, 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 and senior ensign Rubio <laughs> would be, like, marching up Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue, like, ready to scale the fucking fence of the White House. And meanwhile, now they're just like, keeping praise on this guy, right? Yeah. So get that out of the way. I clearly Bolton thinks that he's engaged in some kind of psyop. Yeah, I he's mean, releasing it, little videos it's, of himself. Yeah. Well, it's obvious. He's saying, like, these three people were willing to defect, and Maduro was going to get on this plane. And 
I'm going to go meet in the tank and talk about military options with the generals. He clearly thinks that he's getting inside the heads of the Maduro people, but there's no evidence that that's working, you know? And, and there were some pretty troubling signs that day, even if you're sympathetic to Guaido and the opposition, which I think most people are. You know, Guaido, nothing, there was no broad military support that came behind him. Leopoldo Lopez getting out of uh, house arrest was a step, but by the end of the day, he's taking refuge in the uh, Chilean embassy, which doesn't suggest that he feels it's even safe for him to be out and about in Venezuela. Yeah. It doesn't feel like a situation that is tipping in their direction. So it feels like in the absence of that happening, Bolton just thinks he's running this psychological operation on the Venezuelans, but there's no evidence that that's working. There was also a report that in a meeting at the White House, in the Situation Room, the kind of meeting you were in a lot, uh, it sounded like a deputies meeting. And you remember how the 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 number two guy at the Joint Chiefs was always in the deputies. You know, yeah, he's yeah. Usually like Sandy Winnefeld, fucking hard ass guy. Yeah, they're great. Like, you know, by the book, and it's now this guy uh, Paul Silva and some armchair NSC ideologue <laughs> staffer for Bolton was apparently hectoring him about yeah. the need for military options. You saw this, right? I'm just trying to imagine some situation where some like backbench NSC guy is like yelling at the fucking vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs demanding military options for Venezuela that, that there's a reason they don't exist. Well, who apparently slammed his hands down on the table yeah. so hard and so loud that I assume like his West Point class ring nearly snapped yeah, the table yeah, in half yeah, yeah, and the yeah. meeting was adjourned. Like that's how it ended. And these guys, they look like they could break you in half over their knee. You know, Mostly because they could. But because, but like the, the reality is, what, what do you mean? What is the military option? Are we going to right. send in the special forces to capture Maduro? Are we, I've heard force in humanitarian aid. So what, U.S. ground troops are right. going to enter into Venezuela? Like, are we going to bomb something in Venezuela? Like, they keep talking about military options. Like, what the fuck are they? So let's talk about that for a second. Because, so Venezuela has lots of, of Russian weapons and hardware. It's about the size of Texas. So one of the great mistakes the U.S. made in the Iraq war is that when our troops rolled towards Baghdad, there were all these massive weapons caches on the side of the road that were never secured, right? So unless you have literally... 200,000, 300,000, 400,000 troops that get sent in, you're not going to have the manpower to like keep the peace, win the fight, secure all these weapons caches and then you just again have the most well-armed insurgency you could possibly imagine. Like yeah. this is a this is a rock-style disaster in the making if these guys do this. And it, and it would be in a, a you know, it would be just like you drew insurgents from across the Middle East to Iraq, every leftist revolutionary would descend on Venezuela. We have to prepare ourselves for the fact that let's say there is a military option and let's say we knock over Maduro. Like picture the Saddam Hussein statue falling, right? The triumphalism that will explode. The New York Times analysis piece oh saying that Donald Trump is- Oh no, the Brett Stevens takes. That is not the end of the story. It's the beginning of the story. Yeah. So let's all be prepared that if this happens in Venezuela or God forbid Iran, which would be an even more complicated war, the, the first day of hot takes from everybody saying that Donald Trump just became president and mm -hmm. the Brett Stevens column and the, 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 the deification of Donald Trump is the beginning of what will be a very violent and chaotic and, and almost certainly negative outcome over time. Because, um, again, like Maduro has been arming paramilitary groups. Mm -hmm. he, there are drug traffickers there. It's a hornet's nest of violence and competing factions. So any military option is going to have to involve not just like knocking over the head of the regime, but like, how do you prevent civil violence? How do you prevent looting? How do you prevent just the further destruction of this country and, and human suffering? Mass displacements of people in the Americas. By the way, a lot of those people will try to come to the United right. States, right? And, and Bolton... Uh, specifically said he would not give TPS, Temporary Protected Status, to, or he didn't answer yeah. the question. Marco Rubio, yeah. Private Rubio, has floated the idea of giving TPS to the Venezuelan people. Bolton will not do it, again, showing he doesn't care about them. Yeah, and so Temporary Protected Status allows you to come here and seek asylum. So the reason that this administration can never get there is because ideologically they're hostile to the concept of asylum. Trump is actually proposing policies to make people have to pay for that and to make it more difficult. They say their policies about helping the Venezuelan people, and yet there are millions of Venezuelans outside that country who need help. 3.5 million. slamming the fucking door in their face, which tells you everything you need to know about how he actually feels about the Venezuelan people. The reality, I think, as a cynic is, this is largely motivated by his domestic politics. He's attracting support from some hardline, uh, well, and hardline, but from Cuban-American and Venezuelan-American elements in Florida, 
but he cares less about that than he cares about his immigration message. And that's, by the way, a message to those Cuban and Venezuelan Americans. He doesn't really care about you and, and your people. He cares about his own politics, right? I think there are two other points to make here. One is neither Venezuela or Iran, there's no legal justification <laughs> to go to war. No, um, not, not even close. And, and so Congress should be saying, and I would even be passing resolutions in the House, that there is no authorization for military force in either Venezuela or Iran without this administration coming to Congress. That's a marker worth worth laying down, you know, right right now because they're going to try to you know drum up all kinds of clever legal rationales. Mm -hmm. We need to get on the record now that th th there's nothing authorized about this. Yeah, agreed. Um, let's talk about a different kind of war. We are back in a trade war with China. Uh, over the weekend, hell of a week, man. Yeah, hell of yeah. a week. Over the weekend, Trump threatened to expand tariffs to cover nearly all U.S. imports from China. Um, that understandably spooked the markets on Monday. I believe they're off two percent today uh, as we record on Tuesday. Uh, Trump's trade representative, Bob Lighthizer, said that the U.S. would implement a twenty-five percent tariffs on two hundred billion dollars worth of Chinese imports starting on Friday. Uh, this is all happening as I believe Chinese negotiators are either in D.C. or on their way to D.C. for talks. So. Uh, you know, look, the the, the Chinese are tough negotiators, um, but do you think that that level of brinksmanship is, is the right play? No, um, in part because, uh, like, first of all, all the tariffs so far have hurt us more than China. Yeah. So the people who are paying for the tariffs are U.S. consumers who are paying higher prices and U.S. ag that is not selling some of their goods in China. China is, is, you know, suffering this economic uncertainty, but the, the concrete costs paid for by the tariffs come here. And I think Americans do understand that. And if not, Democrats should be yeah. making well, that point. Trump lies about it every he day. He lies about it every day. That, that they're, they're not filling our coffers. He makes it seem like tariffs are a check that a foreign country it's pays to you when, no, it's something that raises the cost of goods that are imported here. And that means that you just pay more for those goods, right? I mean, that's one of the most clear manifestations in which tariffs has an impact. I think the other problem here is it's like North Korea. Like, step back and let's look at or Iran, like the art of the deal here. What is the goal? What is the goal in Iran? What is, is it regime change? Is it the, a better nuclear deal? Nobody knows what he's doing. He's just ratcheting up. Mm -hmm. What is the goal in North Korea? Is it full denuclearization of North Korea? It doesn't seem like that. Trump has certainly walked back from that. What is the goal of this trade war? What is success? I've long thought that what Trump would try to do is essentially have the con Chinese make some cosmetic concessions, you know, like agree to buy more, you know, like when we got them and to agree to buy more beef or something, mm -hmm. right? And he'll go out and say he won this great victory when nothing really structurally changed in the relationship. But w what is he trying to do? Is he, is he really trying to, to completely overhaul the nature of the trade relationship and the uh, how many goods they sell to us versus what we sell to them? Is he trying to get them to abide by intellectual property protections? I, I don't think anybody watching this knows yeah. why is he he's putting at risk the health of the global economy. And, and again, I think people have to understand these consequences, which are that this is introducing an enormous amount of uncertainty in the markets. It's slowing down the Chinese economy. Okay, Trump points to that as some kind of win, if the Chinese economy slows down, the Chinese buy a lot of stuff from us. Like, this could slow down the entire global economy. This could unravel the decade-long economic boom that we've had in this country, which, by the way, most of which took place under Barack Obama. And, and so he's gambling with, essentially, our own economy and the health of the global economy, and it's not even clear in service of what. That, I mean, I think that's the key point. I think that Trump's goal in all the areas you mentioned, China, Iran, North Korea, is good headlines. Yes. But I don't think that he has a, a real policy decision, which is why you read stories to this day about Gary Cohn and Steve Bannon and all these trade advisors at each other's throats, like literally nearly coming to blows in meetings over China policy. And when Trump doesn't really have a North Star to guide them. Like, can you imagine him sitting down at a National Security Council meeting and, and, and really doing the hard work of talking through objectives and where he wants to end up? Absolutely not. He's yeah. upstairs watching Fox and Friends. He's got other shit to do. So these guys just, like, whoever's up uh, in, in status that week, like, implements his or her own strategy. Right now it's Bolton. 
Yeah, and and I think you know this is a really important broad point. And the world those out there, you know, <laughs> listen to this podcast because they care about these issues. The problem is it kind of works in the short term. So if you look across the board, I'll point to a few foreign policy things. He gets the headline of Trump acts on red line bomb Syria mm-hmm. after the chemical weapons attack. Trump uh, keeps campaign promise, pulls out of Iran deal. Trump has historic summit with Kim Jong-un. Trump getting tougher than any U.S. president on China. Trump recognizes Democratic opposition in Venezuela. All those are actually pretty good headlines, right? And people are thinking, like, this guy's doing stuff. Well, after he bombed Syria, nothing changed in Syria. Not a single thing. The Syrians even rebuilt that runway that he bombed. Yeah, that day. After he pulled out of the Iran deal, nothing changed with respect to Iran's behavior across the region that he was complaining about. Certainly didn't improve. It didn't improve. Sounds like it got worse since we'd sent an aircraft carrier. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. If that's true, then it's gotten worse, right? Trump, uh, you, you know, North Korea has a summit. No change in the North Korean nuclear program, right? Uh, you, Trump recognizes Venezuela in opposition. Well, Nicolas Maduro is still sitting there in Venezuela, right? So on ish, in China, you know, Trump gets tough, puts all these tariffs on board, but w- where is that leading? What is it? What are the Chinese doing that actually really matters in the long run? So he gets the headlines, but none I, I, people need to be smart enough, and I think they are, to understand that like this is not changing anything. What is hurting is American credibility across the board, right? The idea that we would keep agreements, right? So if you're Kim Jong-un and you're looking at Iran, you're thinking, why the fuck would I ever make a nuclear deal Mm -hmm. with someone who's shown that he's just willing to pull out of it, right? Um, If you're looking at the China trade stuff, he pulled out of TPP, which was the way in which we were going to organize all the other Asian countries to put pressure on China together. So all these short-term headlines that he's getting are not only not achieving their objectives, they're gradually weakening the United States over time. And the bill is going to come due for this. And what Trump is counting on is that the bill comes due later <laughs> after he's gone. Um, or after he's reelected. Or after he's reelected when, it doesn't, when he never has to worry about running again. The last thing I'd say is that Trump also ran, this is a point Democrats should be making, on getting us out of wars. But look at Iran, look at Venezuela, and even look at this craziness with China. Not that it's going to lead necessarily in the near term to a war. Like this guy is getting us more in, uh, involved in conflicts that could lead to either military actions in Venezuela and Iran or deeply destabilizing economic wars with China. So he's doing the opposite of what he said he was going to do. Yeah. Well, let's stay on this China piece for a second, because there was a, a great article in The New York Times about how human rights are just not a part of these trade talks with China at all. So as we've discussed on this show a couple times, the Chinese have put millions, literally, of Uyghur Muslims living in Western China in concentration camps. Uh, Michael Barbaro and the folks of The Daily did a two-part special on this that everybody should listen to because this is one of the greatest crimes against humanity happening on the planet right now, and it's not getting the attention it deserves. Um, so, but, but back to the talks, you know, the issue of the Uyghurs is reportedly not a part of uh, the talks. And, you know, my initial reaction to that was it fucking infuriated me. Um, But I wanted to gut check something with you because thinking back to the Obama days, you know, we were doing a negotiation over the Iran nuclear agreement with the Iranians. Now, they do a lot of terrible things. They suppress their own people. They lock up political prisoners. They fund terrorism. Those issues weren't part of the Iran nuclear deal talks because it was seen as such a critical national security objective that putting in other issues on top of it could overly complicate things. Do you think that this is an analogous situation or like, I don't know, I'm, tr- I'm trying to be as charitable as possible to them in the midst of a negotiation as a way of, you know, maybe understanding their priorities better? Well, yeah, I, I, I do think that it is fair that you negotiate with countries on specific issues, right? Um, we negotiated arms control, particularly a- adversarial or competitive countries, right? So we negotiated arms control agreements with the Soviet Union when we didn't like a lot of the things that they were doing. We negotiated, obviously, the Iran deal without bringing in um, other issues because it's, it's a way of isolating a set of problems and, and accomplishing something. And if you create linkages, those can actually become uh, problematic because... Are we, are we suggesting that the Uyghurs are like a bargaining chip? You mm-hmm. know, it, 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 it's... Now, what is also true, though, is that... So I'm, I'm sympathetic to the idea that they might not make the, the Uyghur issue kind of an agenda item in the trade discussions. What is also true, though, is that the U.S.-China relationship is very big, and there are a lot mm-hmm. of issues. 
and the way in which it's usually structured is you have dialogue on lots of, you know, on economic issues, on cyber issues, uh, on Taiwan. I'm not confident at all that they're raising the Uyghurs at all, right? Mm -hmm. So my concern would probably be less that they are not, you know, making the Uyghurs part of the trade discussion. My concern is they're probably not raising at all. And, and they're not publicizing information about it, and they're not bringing it to the UN Security Council, and they're not, <clears throat> frankly, they're not even on the fucking UN Human Rights Council, right. which is where you'd raise some right, of these issues. Right, right. So I'm worried that they're not raising it, period, and that there are all kinds of other places and forums that they could be raising it in. Also, Trump's own behavior seems to validate, you know, he praises Kim Jong-un as someone who's beloved by his people when Kim has people in camps, mm -hmm. right? The issue we've talked about with Rohingya, has Donald Trump said word one about the Rohingya? Um, has he called Aung San Suu Kyi or anybody in Burma about that? Uh, he just doesn't seem to care about this set of issues. Again, unless it's in Venezuela or Cuba, yeah. uh, you, you never hear word one about human rights. So in its own way, you know, I think that is is lending credence to this broader perception in the world that democracies, small d democracies, are in retreat and that autocracies are on, on the advance, that the Chinese model of state surveillance and suppression of religious minorities is more and more the norm in more places, and that, frankly, the trend even in the West with people like Trump um, and you know Viktor Orban and Hungary and far-right parties in Europe and uh, the rogues gallery of Erdogan and Netanyahu and Duterte, that, that all this suggests that that's the future direction of things. That's the most worrying part to me about the, the dynamic with the Uyghurs. Yeah. Well, so that's uh, the perfect segue to the last thing I want to ask you about, which is uh, the White House announced that they're going to host Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban at the White House on May 13th, uh, you know, this uh, it, you know, it's not really jaw dropping anymore. Of course they are. But I mean, I just can't think of a leader who has more systematically undermined democracy uh, over the last decade. Basically, he seized control of the media. Civil society in Hungary has been smothered with regulations and rules that make it impossible to function. It's a constant drumbeat of xenophobia and Islamophobia. And now we welcome this dude into the Oval Office. I mean, is there any argument for, for taking this meeting? No, no. That what was Hungary like a, you know, is there nuclear weapons interest no. in Hungary? Is there, there's no reason, you know, there's no pressing national security reason. The only reason to have Viktor Orban, Viktor Orban is an authoritarian. He has engaged and trafficked in anti-Semitism. He is, you know, shut down free media. He's shut down the independence of the rule of law. He's so outside the boundaries of what our democratic values in the West that the EU has been in this constant fight with him. Um, so for Trump to validate him with a White House visit is sending a message that he's on the side of authoritarianism in Europe at a time when Europe is teetering between the, you know, not, I won't even say progressive, just democratic values, mm -hmm. right? Um, versus these authoritarians. Orban is kind of the quintessential, he's the front man, he was the first guy to, to test out this model and have it work, where he consolidated power through authoritarian means. And so for Trump to validate that is incredibly dangerous. It's saying that America is not on the side of people who are fighting corruption in Hungary and fighting anti-Semitism in Hungary and fighting for a free press. He's on the side of the man who's locking those people up or, or intimidating those people. And, and that, that to me, is in, incredibly troubling. It was also notable that this meeting was announced the same day that Secretary of State Mike Pompeo's meeting with Chancellor Merkel in Germany and her foreign minister was canceled. Yeah, it's like a big fuck you. What, what world are we living in when they get along with Viktor Orban, who's a crypto fascist, and they don't get along with Angela Merkel, who's been holding up almost single-handedly the, the free world in Europe for, for years now. It, it's mind-boggling that this is happening. And it's also interesting, get you, the headline issue, like, he doesn't pay much cost for it. No. You know? I mean, when you really step back, we got more heat from Congress and the media for like a diplomatic agreement with Iran to prevent a war or, f you know, for some of the efforts that we, you know, engaged in overseas to, to change problematic aspects of our foreign policy 
than this guy just kind of going full authoritarian on us, you know? Yeah. It, um, we just don't have a, we don't have our the, own state run media to drive a message. Right. Yeah, Remember when the yeah. Dalai Lama visited the white house and yeah. he went out a side entrance and he had to walk by the trash and it was a horrible, horrible optic and it was embarrassing yeah. for us. But you know, Fox news did that nonstop for a week. And like, it was a thing that broke through and we just, we don't have a way to make that happen. Yeah. It, it, no one is, knows who Victor Orban is unless we tell him. It, to, to me, the worry I have is that the consequences of this, again, they play out over time. And, you know, if we look up in five years, five years of this stuff, there is no international order. There, there are no more real U.S. alliances. Authoritarianism is sweeping the world. And no one will be able to point to the one moment when it tipped. But it's been happening before our eyes the whole time. And, and, and the press doesn't seem to be able to find the language to describe it, you know, yeah. um, that this is this is profoundly abnormal <laughs> um, to have a president who's more comfortable with authoritarians and Democrats, to have a president who, like a bull in China shop, tears up agreements and goes around the world looking for fights. Yeah. Um, have a president who not only doesn't defend democratic values around the world, he attacks them at home, the independence of the rule of law, uh, the 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 role of a free press in our society. Like, you have to kind of c consistently pull yourself back and be like, this is not normal. Like, we have a fundamentally authoritarian, undemocratic president. And then sometimes, you know, someone like me will say that, and, and you know, I'll get the response on Twitter, like, oh, like, you know, go, you know, look at Rhodes, he's so upset. Like, okay, so you want to turn this country into a, a fascist dystopia to own the libs? You know, <laughs> like, like, <laughs> What is wrong with people out there? You know, like this is because the same pe Lindsey Graham w w used to get on the high horse with John McCain and talk to us about democracy and how we needed to be doing more to stand for democracy. And now he's so busy, you know, carrying uh, Trump's briefcase and owning the libs that he's literally emboldening and, and enabling and validating like a fundamentally authoritarian approach to politics and foreign policy. Yeah. It's I fucked mean, up. Counterculture for our parents was like uh, opposing wars and going to Woodstock. And counterculture these days seems to be like these strange, creeping, authoritarian, you know, chat rooms and 4chan and 8chan yeah, and yeah, shit. Yeah, it's yeah, just yeah. unnerving. Yeah. Uh, let's end with one happy thing. Uh, yeah. uh, Prince Harry and Meghan Markle had a baby. Uh, do you give a shit? Do I, do you, do you, are you a Royal watcher? Did you watch the wedding when the, remember when the Europe director at the white house, national security council, Europe director had a wedding watch party that I think kicked off at 3 AM Eastern or something so they could see it. I'm like, I'm, I'm kind of into it. Um, and, uh, I have to say, so I, I, I met Prince Harry. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. It's one of the cooler things about me. Um, I, <laughs> I'll be the actually, judge of that. <laughs> uh, I met Prince Harry like uh, a year and a half ago. We went over to Kensington Palace. Uh, I was at the bomb. We spent like an hour, hour and a half with the guy. Like just super cool, smart guy. Was focused on how to improve the situation for youth around the world. Does a lot of community-oriented stuff in the UK. Does a lot of stuff with Wounded Warriors. Like he comes across as like a fundamentally decent guy who's been through a lot of shit, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there's a step back here. I mean, you know, that's a pretty rough deal he was handling. Losing your really. mom. And your parents have this weird divorce that everybody knows yeah. about. You, your mom gets killed in this horrific accident. You know, he had his ups and downs as a teenager. And to mm -hmm. see him kind of come out the other end, like that's why people pull for the royals. It's not just because they're these like rich, powerful people. It's in part because you've kind of seen this guy go through a bunch of shit and come out on the other end as a pretty fundamentally decent human being. And he's married to an American. He's married to an American who's an African American. That 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 matters. She's people. cool. I yeah. was a Suits fan way before I heard about this wedding nonsense. I, Obama was a Suits fan. I, I actually, you know, I wasn't, but I'm I'm there for it. Uh, yeah, I'm here for the Suits. Um, and I, you know, like that that matters to people. That this the, the ultimate emblem of kind of you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, white privilege. You know, mm -hmm. the British royal family doesn't get more than that. You have like an African American member who's welcomed into that family, and you have some diversity in that family. Like that, I think that matters to people around the world as a symbol. So, in addition, like the royals are just kind of like the queen is cool. Like, do the, you know? Do, do the I don't know. I'm asking you this, but do the British people 
like are they pop are the royals popular i mean or are they is there a significant faction that's like why are we wasting our taxpayer dollars on these people no, I think they are. The Queen is popular, and Harry and William are popular. Um, no offense, Charles, but no, no. I mean, I think it gets to some of the <laughs> the people in there. He's a listener, and, and yeah, um, I mean, maybe Charles is too. I I think that look, we we've talked a lot about Brexit in this pod. Mm-hmm. You know, every country, w- what is the national identity of the country, mm-hmm. right? And when you look at the royals, and you particularly look at the Queen, like she was there in World War, World War II when they were in the shit. She was there through the breakup of the British Empire, handled that gracefully. Um, has weathered, has been a presence in the lives of the British people through everything that has happened and has kind of carried herself with a certain kind of dignity. And I think, you know, people are into that and they, that matters to them. Um, have I ever told the story on the spot about when I, what happened to me with the Queen in Normandy, though? No. Um, so I should put this in my book, but it's a good story. Um, was that the trip I was on? Yeah, no, no. This is, um, this is in, uh, tr- uh, this is on the 50th anniversary of okay. the D Day invasion, right? Okay. So in 2014, and we're in Normandy, and I had been out the night before um, in Paris. As one does. Uh, with Cody Keenan uh, and some other people. Um, and because I had nothing to do that day. Like the trip was over. The last stop of the foreign trip. You always remember the last time of the foreign trip, so now you go yes. out, right? And the speech only speech is done. Speech is done. The meetings are done. Press so is briefed. The only thing that was going to happen the last day is this kind of ceremonial event with the leaders in Normandy. So we fly there, and I'm, you know, I'm not feeling that great. And I'm in the staff area. There's always some staff area where people are grazing on a bunch of food, and all the leaders are in some chateau in, in Normandy. And suddenly Pete Souza comes looking for, for me or Susan Rice or somebody. He's like, Obama's talking to Putin. Obama's talking to Putin. And this is at the height of tensions over Ukraine. I'm oh like, God. fuck. <laughs> like someone's got to be there just to hear what happened, and maybe the will have to sure. read out to the press. So I run with Pete Souza into this chateau, it didn't even occur to me that I wasn't allowed to be there, like it was leaders only, because I'm just like, I'm thinking, I'm just, I got to get there, right? <laughs> so I'm like running through, I'm like running past Angela Merkel, <laughs> all the leaders are sitting there watching this, some of them have iPhone cameras up of Obama and Putin, so I get up next to Obama and Putin, and they're talking, Pete's taking pictures, and I'm trying to listen to it, and this conversation ends, and I'm like, Phew, you know, I'm wiped out, so I go to find the restroom, and I swear this pays off. <laughs> you ever like go up to the door and you're rattling the door <laughs> and you can't get in? No. Like, it, but you don't know whether it's locked or no. not. No. So like four or five times I'm like jangling the knob. I'm like <laughs> no. just trying to get in because I just wanted to go like run some cold water on my face. I'm like fuck. So I finally step back from this door like, <sighs> and the second I step back, the door opens, and it's the Queen of fucking England, <laughs> the Queen of England, the the Queen of England, man. Like that's <laughs> what did you say? That's like the, the top person in the world. Like yeah, the Pope you, you don't the rattle the door England, while right? she's and she looks at me going pee or whatever. She, you know, she always has that handbag. Yeah, she like adjusts. She holds up her forearm and just adjusts this handbag on her forearm and looks at me like I'm the biggest fucking loser <laughs> that has ever walked the face of the earth. And just kind of makes eye contact and just walks right by me without saying anything. Did you go tell Obama like I think I just <laughs> I went and, <laughs> reignited so, a war? So then I went. And actually, Obama was with David Cameron. And so I told him this immediately, of course. And the two of them laughed for about <laughs> the three minutes and made fun of me the rest of like the time of the administration. You know, it's too bad Cameron uh, led to the greatest disaster in recent British history. He was a funny guy. He was a funny guy. He was nice. He was yeah. friendly. He's nice. He's a good guy. He'd always like, walk up to staff. That's my, queen. that's my queen. Unfortunately, that's my queen story. That's I have a much better Prince Harry story, which is he was a good dude. a hell of a yeah. uh, Queen of England story and a great place to end the <laughs> yeah, pod. Yeah. Uh, next week, I don't know what we're going to talk about. No, I don't know because it's bad and this is all this bad news. The Queen's a funny note to end on because like, Whenever you think it's really bad, you look at the fucking Queen of England, and you're like, we've been through some more shit, right? Yeah, like, they do. She came through World War the II Blitz and, and, all, right, Blitz yeah. and all this stuff. Like, we're not there yet. Not there yet. That's a, that's a great tagline for the show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're not there yeah. yet. All right. Thank you guys for listening. Uh, I'm, we're going to do a thing where we just force ourselves to remember and tell more fun stories from the White House days because the yeah. majority of them are not cool. They're not like the West Wing where you write the phrase that saved the day and – you know, uh, solve the problem. It's trying to rip open the door while <laughs> yeah, the uh, yeah, Queen yeah, of England's yeah. taking a piss. Like that—that <laughs> yeah, that happens yeah. more often than you think, and uh, those are fun. Yeah, those are good. All right, talk to you guys.